Він був один із тих, над чиїм обличчям Бог провів долуни у вісні, тож вони знають і те, чого не знають. Наповнюються здогадами та підозрами, а крізь заплющені повіки їм вважаються відблиски далеких світів. Które z nich to ja? Było nas piętnastu w klasie tego dnia. Czy ja to? Albert Nowak? Jan Góracki? Michał Ramer? Izrael Igel? Eliasz Hersik? Nikt nie zauważył jego lewego ramienia w cieniu, które dotknęło mojego prawego barku. Zamarłem z piłą w ręku. Dlaczego on wybrał właśnie mnie? Czy zrobiłem coś nie tak? Może źle trzymałem piłę. To był mój nauczyciel plastyki z Drochobycza, Bruno Schulz. At the furthest edges of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains, lay the small provincial town of Drochobycz in the kingdom of Galicia. Here, Bruno Schulz was born 12th July 1892, the youngest of three children, to a family of assimilated Jewish merchants who owned a textile materials shop on the market square of the town center. He grew up in a multicultural swarm of nationalities, where the more numerous Jewish population lived side by side with Poles and Ukrainians in a tenuous relationship. He wrote in Polish, was fluent in German, and his Jewish heritage exerted a marked influence on his artistic and literary imagination. As a student, he briefly studied architecture in Lvov and later in Vienna, and as an artist, he was entirely self-taught. He would spend his entire life in his native Drohobic, making his living teaching drawing and crafts at the local high school. And likewise, his entire life would end in Drohobic, only a hundred meters from where he was born, when murdered by a Gestapo officer. So it is, so it happened, unprepared for and completed, at an accidental point in time and space, without settling of accounts, not arriving at any finish line, as if in the middle of a sentence, without a full stop or exclamation mark, without judgment and wrath. This was a half-real, half-imaginary Drohobic, never ceased to fascinate Schulz, to which his whole being was inextricably bound. Nothing happens here by chance, nothing results without deep motive and premeditation. Here events are not ephemeral surface phantoms, they have roots sunk into the deep of things and penetrate the essence. Here decisions take place every moment, laying down precedence once and for all. Everything happens here happens only once and is irrevocable. In the mid-19th century, oil was discovered in the neighboring town of Borisov. A black gold rush ensued, and Borisov became one of the largest oil towns in the world, a veritable wild American Klondike with its streets literally awash in oil. The Rehobish would serve as its financial center, and of which the Jews, both rich and poor, would play a vital role. Bruno's older brother, Isidor, was technical director of the Galicia Oil Company. At the time this photograph was taken, Isidor was financially supporting his close family as well as supporting Bruno artistically. Isidor had also opened the Urania Cinema in Drohobic, where Bruno was a keen viewer and confided his enthusiasm for Walt Disney's cartoons. 
In 1920, at the age of 28, Schulz began work on a cycle of graphics entitled The Book of Idolatry, to be offered for private sale in a hound-bound portfolio. The cycle displays some 20 images of an undisguised confessional nature in which Schulz himself is one of the main characters in the drama. They depict a secret zone of men in varying states of masochism, obsessively worshipping a female idol who reigns imperiously. To make a living through his art, Schulz, at the age of 32, is officially certified to teach drawing at the Władysław Jagiełło State Gymnasium. He will hold this position for the next 17 years until 1941, one year before his death. Being a full-time teacher now meant that he was only able to create in stolen moments. His first attempts at writing were to be found in elaborate postscripts of letters to the poet Deborah Vogel, which would eventually become the text for his first collection of short stories entitled Cinnamon Shops, entirely funded by his brother Isidor. These twelve stories score a mythical era of a timeless and transcendent Drohobich, whose labyrinthine streets and interiors are transfigured in great fugues around mythological figures and where ultimately no center can ever be reached. Nineteen thirty five. Bruno Schulz's older brother Isidor suddenly dies, and his death leaves Schulz without any further financial help to support his sick sister and son on his meagre income as a teacher. In the same year, Schulz becomes engaged to Josefina Szelinska, to whom he will dedicate his second collection of short stories entitled Sanatorium under the Sign of the Hourglass. You know as well as I that from the point of view of your home, from the perspective of your own country, your father is dead. This cannot be remedied. That death throws a certain shadow on his existence here. September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. In accordance with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact between Hitler and Stalin, a defeated Poland is now divided between the two of them. Drohobych is immediately annexed to the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. 
Stalin's terror commences immediately with roundups, arrests and mass deportations. Schulz has little future as either writer or artist. He continues to teach in what is now a Soviet school. In 1941, with Operation Barbarossa, the Germans attack the Soviet Union and retake the Rohobich. Schools close and Schulz loses his job. The Nazi occupation commences ruthlessly against all inhabitants of Drohobych. Under the most zealous murderer of Drohobych Jews, the Gestapo officer Felix Landau initiates forced labor, deportations to death camps and mass killings. Listopada mają nas zlikwidować. Nas, Żydów. They're supposed to liquidate us by November. Us, Jews. Aside from this criminal debauchery, Landau takes a particular interest in Bruno Schulz's art and in exchange for protection, Landau demands from him various paintings, including a mural for his children's bedroom in the Villa Landau. Schulz is given an armband, signifying he is a useful Jew. He is forced to leave his home and move into the ghetto, where he and his family occupy a room in a one-story house. After a violent pogrom in neighboring Borisław, where over 1,500 Jews, including Schulz's last regular correspondent Anna Płockier and her husband, are shot and buried in mass graves, Schulz realizes the end is near. In the hope of preserving his drawings and manuscripts, he entrusts them to less endangered people outside the ghetto. 19th November 1942. On a day called Black Thursday, a wild action takes place by the local Gestapo, who rampage the streets randomly, killing passers-by. Schulz is caught by a Gestapo officer and shot twice in the head. Over 200 Jews were murdered that day. Testimony varies as to where Schulz is buried, possibly in the destroyed old Jewish cemetery where his parents were interred and where in the 1950s a Soviet block of flats was built. Or in the new Jewish cemetery on the outskirts of the town in an unmarked grave close to the cemetery wall and not far from the mass grave to the victims of Black Thursday. In 2001, 60 years after the death of Bruno Schulz, the documentary filmmaker Benjamin Geisler and his father discovered the lost murals that Schulz painted for the children of Gestapo officer Felix Landau. They are found in a tiny room, being used as a pantry, beneath layers of paint. Here we see Alfred Schreier, former student of Bruno Schulz, pointing out the mural to the owner of the flat, Mrs. Kawuzny. Polish and Ukrainian art experts arrive and commence meticulous restoration work on what can only be seen as the final living crypt of Bruno Schulz. 
Polska 85 metrów. Tak, tak. Zapraszam pana Wojciecha, bo jest tu twarzyczka. Cudownie. Boże. No i ta jest chyba typowa. O oh my god. <grym> ta jest typowa i to przypomina w ręce autoportrety. Ach, boch mój. <grym> But even this script will be violated and Schulz will be deported. There is international outrage as Israel's Yad Vashem secretly swooped in and crudely pried the murals from the walls and then illegally smuggled them back to Israel, stating that Schulz belonged to the Jewish nation because he had died at the hands of the Gestapo. The issue was settled in 2008 when Israel fully recognized Schulz's murals as the property and cultural wealth of the Ukraine and are presently on long-time loan to Yad Vashem. The remaining fragments left in place have now been restored and moved to the collection of the Bruno Schulz Museum in Drohovic. Whilst all around him death and deportations reigned, Schultz survive each day walking from the ghetto to Landau's villa to bestow scenes of innocence taken from Grimm's fairy tales. Little would he know that this self-portrait of himself painted on a wall in Drohobic as a carriage driver that he, Bruno Schultz, wouldn't survive this fairy tale wearing the helmet that he had hoped would protect him. This can now only lend yet a further dignity to his much too brief life. <laughs>